So thank you all for coming. Um, this has been a labor of love since May and with a lot of hard work from a lot of volunteers on the Law Review and assistant editors and senior editors, we are finally here today. And I just wanted to also thank all of our sponsors who have provided us with generous contributions to help fund the event today, especially the Community Life Service at the University of Ottawa and the Student Federation at the University of Ottawa. And just so you know, uh, you might have heard my name before. I'm Rachel Gold. I'm the symposium coordinator for this year. You will see me around most of the day. And I'll be the master of ceremonies for um, all the panels and the keynote speakers. So we hope you enjoy the day with us. And we want to start it off with having the dean of the common law um, section of the University of Ottawa give us some introductory remarks to begin the day. Thanks very much. You can hold your applause. <laughs> Bonjour à, à tout le monde, à chers conférenciers et invités, à chers conférencières invités, présidents et présidentes des panels, à membres du comité de symposium bénévolé, il y en a beaucoup, à membres de communautés universitaires et partout, tous ces deux. Bienvenue au symposium 2011-2012 de la revue de droit d'Ottawa pour commémorer le 25e anniversaire d'Arrête Oaks. Uh, I'd like to congratulate all the, uh, the students in our faculty uh, and the members of the Ottawa Law Review, uh, Rachel of course, but the many, many, and I see many are named in the materials for which I'm grateful, uh, not only for their work on this conference, but uh, the Ottawa Law Review is a huge part of our faculty, and in, in particular I would point to their highly successful fundraising for the Snowsuit uh, uh, Fund and for really putting out a first class academic law review. Uh, these are uh, people that make our law school a better place, and uh, I know the faculty appreciates the efforts, and I hope your uh, your fellow students uh, do also. Felicitations aussi au professeur conseil Ravi Malhotra. Uh, Ravi is here, I think, if you want to wave, Ravi, and uh, Mark Power, who I haven't uh, uh, seen yet, but I'm sure he'll uh, be here for uh, their advisory role. If you think about it, there are a few richer questions for a law school conference than to examine what constitutes a demonstrably justified uh, interference of a basic constitutional right in a free and democratic society. C'est une question fondamentale, une question importante uh, qui mérite et uh, qui exige votre attention critique uh, aujourd'hui. Uh, je, te, uh, je vous souhaite uh, un jour stimulant. I, I wish you a stimulating uh, conference on a, on a topic well worth your time. Thank you very much. I'm back. <laughs> That wasn't too long. Uh, so I wanted to just introduce uh, our first keynote speaker. That's Justice Robert Sharp from the Court of Appeal of Ontario. So he is a justice there right now. And he was a previous dean at the University of Toronto. And he's also written several scholarly articles and books, including Brian Dixon, A Judge's Journey. Little known fact about Justice Sharp is that he served as the executive legal officer at the Supreme Court of Canada for the late Ch Chief Justice Brian Dixon. So he'll be able to give us some interesting insight on the history of the Oaks Test and the circumstances surrounding its creation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Justice Robert Sharp. Merci, merci de m'avoir invité à participer à ce, à ce symposium pour commémorer le 25e anniversaire de l'arrêt Oaks. 
Nous savons aujourd'hui que Hoax est un des plus importants arrêts de la Charte. Hoax a été considéré, appliqué et réinterprété trois fois par la Cour suprême et le, et le débat sur Hoax continue aujourd'hui à cette colloque et sans doute ce débat continuerait dans le futur devant les tribunaux du Canada et dans les facultés de droit. Pour commencer cette discussion d'aujourd'hui, je propose de présenter une perspective historique. Hoax était un des premiers arrêts de la charte prononcée par la Cour suprême et je vous invite à considérer Hoax dans son contexte historique, une époque où la charte des droits et libertés était nouvelle, son interprétation et son effet à déterminer. Oaks, as you probably know, was argued in 1985. The decision was handed down in 1986. And of course, it was one of the very first uh, charter cases uh, to reach the Supreme Court. And I'd like to consider today Oaks in the context, we now talk about trilogies. I'm going to invent a trilogy, the, the, what I call the foundation trilogy. The foundation trilogy are the first three major charter cases, Hunter and Sutherland, Big and Drug Mart, and Oaks, and try to see what themes emerge from those cases. Those cases, of course, laid the basic structure uh, for, and the basic framework for charter interpretation and charter application. Now, when those cases were argued and before they were decided, Most of the people in this room are far too young to remember this, but some of us will remember. And what we remember was there was a great deal of uncertainty about the import of the Charter. What, if anything, would the judiciary uh, make of it? There had, of course, been a very lively debate about the idea of an entrenched Charter of Rights. Uh, and, of course, the pro-charter forces uh, won the day. And there was a certain sense of euphoria among people who wanted a charter. Uh, and clearly, a political will by the political actors uh, to enact a charter. But there were some very, very major questions. And I think one of the most major question, questions was as to the willingness and the capacity of the judiciary to make something uh, of the Charter. I think it's fair to say, although it's long before I was a judge, that most Canadian judges were highly dubious about the idea of a Charter. They had been educated, practiced law, and they judged without the Charter. And they were pretty confident about their ability uh, to do justice without the Charter. Uh, they were suspicious, they were worried about the burden it would impose, they were skeptical about its need, and they were concerned about being dragged into political debates, which is what a lot of people thought the Charter uh, would do. Now, the attitude of the Canadian judiciary, we, we can, it's, in terms of interpreting fundamental rights, was demonstrated by the miserable job they did with the Canadian Bill of Rights. The, 1962 uh, statute. They took a narrow, legalistic uh, approach, and the Bill of Rights had very little Im import, impact. The rights were interpreted in an exceedingly narrow and technical uh, fashion. So that's the setting on which, when the Charter lands on the Canadian judiciary. Now, as has been mentioned, I did the, the biography of Chief Justice Dixon. And so I'm going to base this on what I did in that biography and sort of look at it a little bit from his uh, point of view, uh, because, of course, he was the author of those three, what I call the Foundation uh, Trilogy. And what I'm going to suggest is I'm going to look a little bit at some of the speeches he made as, uh, when the Charter was announced and at these three judgments. And I'm going to suggest there's sort of three basic themes that emerge uh, from uh, Dixon's thinking. The first thing is there's a boldness to it. There's a, a courage and a boldness uh, to his approach to the Charter. He felt that 
the politicians had sent a message to the judiciary by enacting the charter and that there was a clear mandate for the judiciary to do something with it and he was willing <coughs> to do something with it. So there's, the, there's a, a boldness. Mixed with that, there's a, there's a sense of discipline. There's an insistence that although we have to be bold, we also have to be firmly rooted in our legal tradition. So when we give broad-based interpretation of rights, we have to make sure that they have some ground in our legal uh, tradition, even though the Charter was a departure uh, from that tradition. And the third theme, I think, that emerged is the insistence on seeing the Charter in democratic terms. In other words, seeing not in terms of a conflict with democracy, but as being consistent with, totally consistent with, uh, democracy. So those three the themes, I suggest, come out of these three cases and certainly come out of the, of the Oaks case. <clears throat> now, he, he made a lot of speeches because he thought that, ju that the judiciary needed to start thinking about this before the first cases came. And some of them are quite uh, remarkable. In, in one speech he says, we face a great, this is to judges, we face a great challenge. We've been given a weighty responsibility. The eyes of individual Canadians will be on us as never before. So there's a sense of, of pressure, of urgency that the, the, the judiciary uh, faced. Uh, he said, the Canadian judiciary, and in particular the Supreme Court of Canada, will either breathe life into the Charter or reduce it to a hollow, hollow promise of things that might have been. So he's aware uh, that the eyes of the country uh, were upon him. Now, he said some things that I'm sure startled judges. For example, at a speech at Dalhousie Law School, he said, the meaning of the charter is not to be found by consulting a dictionary. Charter interpretation requires a philosophical and possibly political theory as context. The courts, he said, will have to go beyond abstract logic and disembodied precedent. When the occasion cries out for new law, let us dare to make it. Let us recognize that law is a living organism. Its purpose is to serve life. Its vitality is dependent upon renewal. Now you have to see those remarks in the context of a legal culture that was still imbued with what I would describe, for want of a better word, as legal formalism. By that I mean the idea that law could be derived from statutes and decided cases and applied deductive, sort of through deductive logic to resolve disputes in a purely objective, mechanical fashion. And that it was illegitimate to refer to outside sources such as social context or political context. So he, this, these were startling um, words from our Chief Justice. But at the same time, he said uh, that we must uh, be careful. We must, and this is the sort of the discipline that I mentioned, uh, the, the chain, it, we cannot have change at late nights, break next week, cost, predictability and certainty are still solid values in the law. He said the Charter is a mechanism for peaceful progressive change, but also an anchor in the storm of social evolution to ensure that fundamental Canadian values are immutable and shielded from encroachment by majority will. So that sense of discipline and the sense that we are in a democracy and the way we interpret the Charter has to be consistent with that uh, democracy. La première cause importante est plaidée devant la Cour suprême était uh, Hunter contre Saul. La question soulevée était de savoir si le pouvoir donné par la loi relative aux enquêtes uh, sur les co coalitions aux directeurs d'enquête et recherche d'autoriser les perquisitions et les saisies étaient incompatibles avec l'article 8 de la Charte qui protège le, le droit d'individu contre les fuites et les perquisitions et les saisies abusives. Um, les mots avec le qui, qui uh, 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 Le juge Dixon a commencé son jugement avec ces mots. La Constitution du Canada, qui contient la Charte des droits et libertés, est la loi suprême du Canada. Elle rend inapparente la disposition incompatible de toute autre règle de droit. 
Ce sont des mots d'article 22, euh, d'article euh, 52, mais aussi une déclaration, une déclaration de la volonté du, du juge Dixon et de la Cour suprême de faire quelque chose de la Charte. Dixon, of course, explained in quite lofty terms how constitutional interpretation had to be different, that the Constitution was a permanent document and had to be adapted and adopted to meet changing uh, needs, um, that the courts had to take into account the broader social context. So we have that boldness, that boldness, but we have the discipline. Where does he get the boldness from? He refers to the living tree. And of course, the living tree theory of constitutional interpretation had a very respectable pedigree. The 1928 decision of the Judicial Council, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, that held that a woman was a person and that the words in the Constitution didn't have, weren't frozen in meaning uh, to the meaning they had in 1867. The Constitution is a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its lateral limits. Now, there's a little bit of sleight of hand here, because although we think of the living tree as a you know, basic principle of our Constitution, it was, the case was decided in 1928. You have to wait until the late 1970s, and particularly the era of the Charter, before you see the Supreme Court citing the person's case and the living tree. So Dixon had that foundation, as I say, he, he kind of burnished it up a little bit uh, to put it back into action in the, in the era of the Charter. Now, of course, the other element from Hunter and Southern is the purpose of approach. You all know how Dixon looked very deeply into our legal tradition. He looked at English cases, he looked at American cases, and he said, what is it about search and seizure? What, what are the basic principles that emerge? Because he only had those very few words in Section 8. What does that mean to be protected against unreasonable search and seizure? And he said a purpose through using this, I would call it quite bold, purpose of approach, we come up with three basic propositions. The basic propositions, of course, are one, there has to be some prior authorization for a search. Two, it has to be authorized by an independent arbiter, and three, it has to be on a reasonable and probable grounds standard. And of course that uh, led the court to strike down the section of the Combines Act that allowed the minister, the uh, director of research to simply authorize that on his own motion. Maintenant la règle began. Le dimanche 30 mai 1982, les policiers de la ville de Calgary ont été témoins de plusieurs opérations dans le Big M Drug Mart, dont la, la vente des produits d'alimentation, des gobelets, de plastique et un cadenas de bicyclette. Big, Big M a été accusé d'avoir enfreint l'article 4 de la loi sur le, sur le dimanche. Big M a soulevé la liberté de religion pro, euh, protégée par l'article 2 et a, et a été acquitté. Uh, uh, la Cour d'appel a rejeté l'appel de la, la Couronne et la cause a été plaidée devant la Cour suprême uh, en, 19, en 1984. To decide this case, Dixon made what I think is one of the most extraordinary uh, statements in, uh, you, you find in a judgment. It's really sent a signal. And what he said was, um, yeah, I have to find it. If, if I am a Jew, remember Dixon is an establishment figure, an Anglican, uh, high office in the Anglican Church. If I am a Jew or a Sabbatarian or a Muslim, the practice of my religion at least implies my right to work on a Sunday if I wish. It seems to me that any law, purely religious in purpose, which denies me that right, must surely infringe my religious freedom. So he put himself in the position of a minority religious adherent to assess the impact of uh, the Lord's Day Act. A remarkable turn for the judiciary of Canada and a remarkable signal to Canadians of minority, minority, uh, to minority 
groups uh, about what the charter uh, might mean. Now, um, big, uh, the Big M case also deals with this purpose of approach, and you know that there's pages and pages of research on religious freedom, what it means, what it meant in England, what it means in the United States, why do we have it in our charter. And so there's this, as I say, the boldness rooted in principle, and then how does this fit with democracy? He's very conscious of all three. How does it fit with democracy? Dixon explained that individual conscience and individual judgment lie at the heart of our democratic political tradition. The ability of each citizen to make free and informed decisions is the absolute prerequisite for legitimacy, acceptability, and efficacy of our system of government. In other words, he says, by striking down this law, I am not striking a blow at democracy, I'm striking a blow for democracy, because I'm vindicating and I'm enforcing the fundamental principle of democracy, that is, a society of individuals free to make their own decisions, their own choices. Finally, I come to Oaks. Uh, Oaks, of course, arose from a routine drug prosecution in London, Ontario. A man called David Edwin Oaks uh, was outside a tavern. Uh, and the police uh, found that he was carrying eight one gram, one gram vials of hash oil and a suspicious amount of cash, $600. Uh, the police didn't seem very convinced that he had uh, got the money from a workers' compensation check. They thought he was uh, trafficking in drugs, and they charged him accordingly. Now, at the trial, uh, Oakes was represented by a lawyer from the Legal Aid Clinic at the University of Western Ontario, um, and um, uh, the, he faced the reverse onus provision that prevailed at the time under the Narcotics Control Act. If the Crown proved that he was in possession of drugs, it was up to him to prove that he was not in possession for the purpose of trafficking. Uh, this uh, legal aid lawyer could see that uh, his, old, his client's, uh, not only his best hope, his only hope, was if they could strike that reverse onus provision down. And he went before the provincial court, now called the Ontario Court of Justice. The judge uh, gave, uh, I thought, quite a brave uh, decision, an oral judgment, saying he would not, that because of the charter, he would not apply the reverse onus provision. He didn't really strike it down. He said, well, I'm not going to apply it. Uh, the case was appealed to the uh, Ontario Court of Appeal uh, by the Crown, uh, where a five-judge court uh, sat. Uh, the senior judge on the panel was the eminent G. Arthur Martin, the Dean of Canadian Criminal Law, I'm sure you've heard the name, uh, and he wrote uh, the decision uh, upholding the trial judge, holding that the reverse onus clause could only be valid if there was a rational connection uh, between the proved fact and the presumed fact, and he said that often if there's only a small quantity of drugs, there would be no rational connection, so I'm not going to uh, so this, the, the reverse onus section uh, is invalid. Now, so far you'll notice we haven't mentioned section one. There's barely a mention of section one, not in the trial court. Martin mentions it, but doesn't really, he, he collapsed the two, what we now think of as the two-stage process all into one. So nobody's really talked about section one. A very uh, ambitious, bright, young law professor called Thomas Cromwell. You may have heard of him. <laughs> now, how's he? he wrote a case note uh, saying, you know, uh, this is a great judgment, great result, but the analysis is all wrong. And we should be looking at a two-stage process. First of all, prove the violation. And secondly, if the Crown wants to justify it, it's up to the Crown to prove the limitation. And he said it's ironic in a case dealing with the burden of proof that Justice Martin gets it all, gets the burden of proof wrong because, of course, by the way he did it, all the burden would fall on the applicant who's trying to strike the law down. And the court, the Crown appealed the case to the Supreme <clears throat> Court of Canada, which cited uh, Professor Cromwell's uh, article. And still, there's very little mention of Section One. 
uh, the case is argued. Uh, the court is clearly going to strike down uh, the Narcotic Control Act reverse onus uh, provision, uh, but as I say, still very little reference uh, to Section 1. The, the, the factums didn't really deal with it. Uh, the argument didn't deal with it. Um, Dixon, as you know from his judgment, uh, uh, felt that Section 1 was crucial to this case. And he thought, he agreed with our friend Professor Conlon <coughs> that the Ontario Court of Appeal, one of those rare occasions, had got it wrong. In terms of the analysis of the result, the Ontario Court of Appeal and the eminent G. Arthur Martin had got it wrong. <coughs> that the way to approach this was, the way they had suggested in, in Big M, and that was generous interpretation of the right, burden on the Crown to justify uh, any limitation. Well, the Oaks judgment exhibits all that, that says that, exhibits the, 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 the qualities uh, that I've mentioned. The boldness didn't hesitate to strike down the reverse onus clause. He identifies it as a hallowed principle lying at the very heart of criminal law. So the, dis the boldness and the discipline, rooting it in what Lord Sankey called the golden thread that runs through criminal law in the, in the Wilmington uh, case. Dixon also located this right in, in human terms, in terms of human rights, and he said that the, a person coming before the courts is entitled to respect and dignity, is entitled to be presumed innocent. This is not just some technical legal rule, this is a basic element of our respect for each other as fellow citizens that we will only be convicted if the Crown can prove our guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and we don't have to prove that we're not guilty. So locating it in the, in the basic principles of our, of our, uh, of our legal uh, uh, tradition. And then when it came to setting out the Oaks test, and I don't have to tell you what it is, because you all know that, you're going to hear a lot more about it, but you'll know that in Oaks, it's set out in very clear terms, it's set out in terms of a stringent standard of uh, justification. Uh, Justice Dixon, again, refers to the third theme that I've mentioned, and that is the democratic principle. He says, that in applying, sec interpreting and applying section one, the court must be guided by the values and principles essential to a free and democratic society. This is section one, which I believe to name a few include respect for human dignity of the human person, commitment to social justice and equality, and a combination of a wide variety of beliefs, respect for cultural and group identity, and faith in social and political institutions which enhance the participation of individual groups in society. These are the underlying values and principles, he said, of a free and democratic society, which this democratic principle, which he sees as lying at the heart of the charter. Now these three cases, Hunter, Big M, and Oaks, were controversial. I think people were said, whoa, this thing does mean something. This charter does mean something. Looking back today, it all seems so simple. Uh, but it wasn't that simple at the time. Uh, it, was, it took courage, it took boldness, and it took the discipline to not just blast off on the charter, but at the same time patiently and carefully root the charter both in the basic principles of our legal tradition and in the principles of democracy. And I suggest to you that is why these three foundational judgments uh, have stood the test of time, because they respect those three values. Thank you. And I'm happy if there are questions to try to answer questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I'll come give you the microphone.
thanks a lot. That was a great uh, paper, Justice Sharp. Uh, 30 years later, it's really hard not to romanticize those amazing judgments and statements. How, why do you think that really important insight that rights reinforce democracy and aren't antithetical to democracy, how come that hasn't caught and we're still stuck in this rut of rights versus democracy? Uh, well, I, I was hoping we weren't still stuck in the rut, but you're probably right. We certainly, it's still, I mean, it's a matter of debate, constant debate. Uh, I completely agree, but I do think that it's important not to lose sight of that, of that point of view, which is, as I say, put so clearly and so strongly uh, that, that democracy can exist without rights, and, and we can't exist without individuals who are capable of exercising individual choice and judgment. It's just so basic. Um, we get caught up in the particular controversy of the moment when the rights holder is uh, advancing the right in a somewhat uh, you know, unpopular cause or a, a, a case that doesn't uh, seem to the public to make sense. And, and we, I think we have to be prepared. That's the job of the judiciary. Prepared to say, stand, stand back and say, well, wait a minute. You may not like this, but this is what, this is what our society means. This is what our legal system means. So I think, I think we just have to stand up to uh, popular, momentary sways of opinion or popular opinion that uh, that hasn't thought it through deeply, the way our legal culture has. Not a very good answer, but I think it just takes a bit of backbone. Bob, well, thanks very much for that great overview. Uh, Bob, can you tell us why those final words, where um, Justice Dixon talked about a free and democratic society, that really hasn't been picked up in all the 30 years since then? Um, any explanation for, for that? Because we focus more on the, the other parts of the Elks test, um, mm -hmm. and it's become a lot of real formalism, which you talked about, as opposed to focusing on that last part, which you emphasized so much, as you rightly said. I don't, I don't know if I can, if I can answer that. Um, I mean, I think that in, in academic debate, we uh, people have, have dealt with it and, and are very sort of almost obsessed about the, the need to reconcile uh, a democracy, uh, with, to reconcile judicial review with, with democracy, to understand how they mesh and, and, and fit together. I mean, maybe we judges haven't done a very good job of uh, presenting that. It's quite, quite possible that it's our fault and that we tend to write these things in narrow terms. This will be the last question because we have to move on to our next keynote speaker. Uh, thank you for the speech, Justice Sharp. Uh, I was wondering, since uh, Brian Dixon advocated for you know judicial decisions that are underpinned by philosophical and political theories, how he would respond to the accusation that this is sort of letting in or justifying judicial activism? Well, I I, I would. Not that I'm capable of doing it the, the way he did, but uh, I, I would refer to the way he did that. And that is my second principle that I say, that he, when you read a Dixon judgment, it is, it is clearly based on a kind of a theoretical, purposive, philosophical approach to law, but he, he always grounds it in our legal tradition. He, he goes back, he studies the, the history of search and seizure. He studies the history of religious freedom and its protection uh, in, in, through constitutions, statutes, etc. And so he, he, he roots his analysis. He, he locates his philosophy in our legal tradition, in legal standards, in our, in our legal culture. And I think that's what's, to me, so strong about these uh, three remarkable judgments.